Hi, I'm Tintin Wisniewski from the Hoover Institution. Hoover's Corette Task Force on K-12 Education, with the help of some friends, has attempted to project what American education might look like in the year 2030. By that time, today's newborn will become college freshmen. The task of looking so far ahead while fre refreshing is also quite formidable. We invite you to join us in this predictive video presentation in search for solutions to the challenges that American education faces in the years ahead. For more information about this project, please visit our website at AmericanEducation2030.com. Martin West is assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and an executive editor of Education Next. He studies the politics of K-12 education policy in the United States and strategies for improving student achievement. His video on education federalism in 2030 examines the changing role of the federal government, states, school districts, amidst ongoing centralization of funding for public education. By 2010, the virtues of federalism in American K-12 education had long been more evident in political rhetoric than in governing reality. The nation's famously decentralized school system, with authority distributed across 50 states and more than 14,000 locally elected school boards, yielded little real diversity in policy or practice. Federal and state laws, regulations, and court decisions had severely eroded school district autonomy. And the areas in which states retained exclusive control, such as standard setting and teacher certification, had become sources of national consternation rather than pride. Yet the root problem was not simply excessive centralization, nor was the appropriate solution simply to devolve control over education policy to the states and in turn to local school districts. For one thing, Americans had rightly come to view their school system's stagnant performance as a national problem warranting a federal response. More important, local school boards, especially in big cities, had long operated under the thumb of teachers unions and other interest groups with a national scope. The notion that devolution under those circumstances would foster authentic local control, much less improve student achievement, was misguided. Fortunately, the past two decades have seen considerable progress toward a set of governing arrangements that capitalizes on the real, if not often realized, advantages of America's compound republic. Much to the dismay of most conservatives, the federal government in 2030 foots more of the total bill for public education than ever before. The run-up in federal spending began with the government's response to the 2008 uh, financial crisis and was sustained over time by the fiscal pressures facing state governments and the renewed threat of school finance litigation in federal courts. All told, Uncle Sam now accounts for roughly one-third of total spending on education, a target that had been set by the National Education Association as far back as the 1970s. Yet this funding increment has made it possible to reorient the federal role in desirable ways. National standards and tests in core academic subjects are now used in all but a handful of states, providing a common benchmark for measuring student achievement. More than one quarter of federal spending is allocated to states based on their progress in improving student performance, and the feds have increased spending on education data gathering and research and development, both clear national priorities by an order of magnitude. State legislatures, in turn, have shifted power away from dysfunctional school boards and empowered parents and the general public to exercise more control over their local schools. To varying degrees, they've encouraged the expansion of charter schooling and other forms of school choice, overhauled certification regimes limiting entry into teaching and school leadership, and altered school board elections in ways that have curtailed union dominance. Brick and mortar charter schools now enroll 10% of students nationally and much larger percentages in almost every major city. Another 10% of students take advantage of non-district schooling options available to them through statewide virtual schools, tax credit funded scholarships, and voucher programs. Together, these programs ensure that school districts once again face authentic competitive pressure. At the same time, state legislatures have freed up school districts to compete by lifting restrictions on their ability to perform their most important task, managing their workforces. Second-generation alternative certification programs allow non-traditional teaching candidates to enter the profession immediately, but require that they demonstrate progress in raising student achievement before receiving a permanent license. The granting of tenure to teachers has been delayed and in some cases limited, eliminated altogether. Some state legislatures have gone so far as to alter the mechanics of school board elections, 
mandating that they be held on the same day as general elections to boost turnout and minimize interest group dominance. Where such steps have been taken, they've reduced the extent to which the material interests of district employees trump the public's interest in getting the most mileage from its tax dollars. On the surface, these changes represent the culmination of a century-long trend toward more centralized control of American public education. Ironically, however, this latest round of centralization has produced more responsiveness to local needs and family preferences throughout the nation's education system. It has not been the proximate cause of recent improvements in student achievement, but the revitalization of education federalism has created an environment in which technological innovations and pedagogical improvements could emerge and flourish.